Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog, and I think this might be my last episode I make tonight, although I might try to make one or two more, um, but it is past midnight now, it's like 12.15, and uh, and I don't want to be up too, too late because of neighbors, obviously, and I got to work tomorrow. Uh, so uh, so what we're going to talk about today is a couple more issues donated to us by Cam Fraser. So Cam, thank you again for these issues. Um, we're going to get into Guardians of the Galaxy number 10 today, which is a King and Black tie-in. All of these are, obviously. Um, we're also going to get into the Captain America issue that just came out last, uh, you know, I guess last week. Um, but uh, Cam sent me the uh, digital code for it a couple days ago, so I thought I'd include it in this episode too. Um, and then also we're going to get into Thunderbolts 1 through 3. And there was also another one shot that came out last week. I think it was Wiccan and Hulkling. I got that digital code from Cam too, so I'll lump that in with another, whatever the next batch is, you know, whatever next five issues we discuss. Uh, but for today, those are going to be the five Guardians of the Galaxy 10. Um, the, you know, the Captain America solo issue and three issues of Thunderbolts, so all three issues of Thunderbolts. So we're going to start first with Guardians of the Galaxy because this is one that I haven't been reading the new Al Ewing Guardians of the Galaxy, and that's what this is. The title card should be up there. Uh, we got Al Ewing as the writer and Juan Cabal as the artist. The book is really well done. Um, it's a little all over the place for me because I'm kind of confused what's happening. Apparently Star-Lord died, um, but then maybe he actually just went to the future and he became an actual star lord and he's like connected to the sun somehow so i'm completely lost <laughs> when it comes to that i actually have no idea what's going on uh and then also at the beginning of this there looks like to be a round table with like the super scroll and a, and a richard rider a nova and a couple other people and they're all discussing this uh you know null going through space and wiping out worlds on his way to earth and uh and so and they even reference the empire's end one shot that we talked about a few months ago whenever that was that uh with the scrolls and the Cree and everything uh with talos and stuff so i thought that was cool that they kind of tied into that and they're like yes the scrolls have heard of this threat too and it's heading to earth and then you also have i think star lord sister or somebody's like spartax is under attack and we need to protect it these uh the the army of null has now ended up on our doorstep so it looks like null himself has either headed to earth or this takes place before null reaches earth but we don't actually see Null himself in here. Again, we just get a dragon. <laughs> it's like, that's what it always is with these tie-ins. It's like, oh, each world, one dragon shows up to wipe out. But on Earth, we got like hundreds of dragons, a uh, couple uh, uh, celestials that are possessed by Null, and then we have Null himself. So Earth is really screwed. Everyone else got one or two dragons, and apparently that was enough to take down most worlds. Um, but uh, but this one, the team is like starting to get together and like, okay, we got to go out and battle this dragon and as they go out and fight it um out of nowhere we have uh star lord shows up he just like appears in the middle of the the like the planet that they're on where they're on spartex trying to fight and uh i like that al ewing does give an explanation of why that is but apparently he's like uh, star lord uh, from what i gathered is moving through time like he went to the future and now he's coming back and forth through time in moments where his heart uh, you know, where he knows he needs to fight with all his heart or help out because something, you know, affects him personally. So this is his home world being attacked and his friends are involved, like Richard Ryder and everyone, they're all involved, like the Guardians of the Galaxy are all involved. So he's coming back more or less to save them. So on a subconscious level, now that he can kind of see all of time and space, he saw that he was needed very much in this moment. So he comes back and like single-handedly with one blast from this gun that he has, uh, wipes out uh, the, the the dragon, or at least we it seems to. Um, I think it, I think it does. I, I can't remember if the dragon because normally the dragon will like you'll blow its head off, and then a part of it will go and bond with other people. But in this one, I think the dragon just gets defeated and falls to the ground, and then the team reunites and are like, "Oh my god, you know, Peter Quill, it's you, it's Star Lord," and he's like, "Yeah," he goes, uh, "Sorry, I, I, I'm I, I'm becoming this." light being of energy and stuff and um, i'm doing all these things and and uh and i've been moving through time and i'm i basically i found my way back here to you guys and it seems like i needed to it was like you guys needed me here the most and they're like well you know and then they start getting visions of Noel, and he's like talking to them and he brings another dragon and then peter wipes it out again and and uh and they're all like get absorbed by the dragon um and he yeah the second I, well maybe it's the first dragon still it gets back up eats them all or whatever and then star lord creates a light and burns through the dragon and they burn their way out of it so for a minute there they're all absorbed by a dragon and Noel's talking to all of them but peter is able to like vaporize the dragon and then they realize okay well the this Noel guy which you would think if Noel sensed a dragon being evaporated so easily by peter quill 
he would want to go deal with that threat. Uh, but apparently not. Apparently no, maybe too far away to feel that connection anymore. I don't know. But uh, but Peter says, like, I can sense these things. They've went to Earth and they're attacking Earth. And they're like, okay, so let's all go to Earth and, like, save Earth. And you, especially if you have this power. And he's like, I can't. And they're like, why not? And he goes, because I, I'm borrowing this power. This My power that I have is half of the gods of Olympus's power. And they're still tracking me, and they want this power back. So if I lead them to Earth, uh, whether they get the power back or not, they're going to they're gonna be another threat Earth has to deal with. So Peter's like, I'm going to trust that the heroes of Earth can stop this null guy and this threat, and we need to not bring another battle to their doorstep, which I'm like, hey, thanks. Like, thank you very much, Peter Quill, because I feel like every time they do these, like, Marvel events, it's always Earth getting attacked, with the exception being Empire, um, but it's always Earth being attacked on, in a lot of cases. So this is nice. I'm like, hey, thanks for not bringing more shit to our doorstep, dude. Um, so the book ends with the, the gods of Olympus, you know, prepping to, you know, go search for uh, Star-Lord moving through, I think, the time stream or something. So uh, so that will continue in the next issue. So this is it. This is the only connection this book has to King and Black, is that they got swallowed by one of the dragons and then burned their way out of it and reunited with Peter Quill. But now he's going to go somewhere else in time and space, I guess, to lead the the, the gods away from them. Um, but the they're still counting down to this big story they're doing, Gardens of the Galaxy. So I may at some point pick up the trades for this because... They're bringing Dr. Doom on the team, and I love Dr. Doom. So I'm curious to see why he would join the Guardians of the Galaxy and what he might bring to the table being a member of the team and how long it will take for him to become the leader of the team <laughs> because that's what Doom does, right? So uh, so I'm curious. But, yeah, I'm liking this book, and even though I was kind of lost in some regards, um, I, I am picking – I'm, like, intrigued enough to where when the trades – when more trades come out, I'll probably start collecting them in trade. So, so yeah, that was really good. Um but then we go over to Captain America. This was a one shot that came out called uh, Black and Blue, not Black and Blue, but Black and Blue. And you can see that up on the screen there. Uh, Danny Lore is the writer, and Mirko Kalak, Stefano Landini, and Roger Antonio and Nico Leon are the artists. That's a lot of artists on this book. Um, and I can tell because like it does shift tonally from page to page. Sometimes uh, you got some good art in this book. I think all the artists do well in their own respect. But at the same time, um, having this many artists on this one story, it just, this feels like very thrown together. Like we need to get a story out there with Falcon and uh, Winter Soldier in it, with teaming up with Captain America. We need to get that out there. Um, that's what this feels like. It just feels like like at the, a last minute addition almost. Um, but I could be wrong. Maybe this is something they planned to begin with. But what this issue is essentially is just Captain America now that he's free from Null, so I guess this takes place after King and Black 4, uh, now he's free from Null and he's back on the streets um, trying to protect civilians again like he was as the other heroes take the battle to Null. So this doesn't spoil anything from, you know, I guess issue 4 or after, um, but, uh, but we do know that the heroes after Venom number 33, a lot of them were freed. So this is Cap now and he's free and he's running around. And uh, he teams up with Falcon and Winter Soldier. But while he's fighting uh, symbiote-infested things and saving people, he still hears remnants of Null's voice in his head. And at first I, I was like, Hi, why are they doing that? Like, I don't really, it doesn't matter. Why are they telling this story, you know? And it makes sense towards the end where Bucky says, Look, I know what it's like to have a voice in your head and, and to fight against, um, you know, programming or instinct or, you know, uh, the opposite of instinct. Like you, you, you hear a darkness in you and you're kind of lean towards it. He's like, I know what that's like. And then, and even Falcon says, he's like, yeah, I've been mind possessed before too. He goes, we all know what that's like. He's like, but you are stronger than that voice. So prove that to the voice and yourself and step up and, and get through this. Cause the whole issue is like cap saving somebody, but then in his head, he's seeing like Bucky being taken over and then them killing each other or Falcon taken over and them killing each other or the innocent people he's trying to save are dying. He's, it's all visions. It's all remnants of Null still in his head. But at a certain point, Cap does overcome it and helps fight back. And so Falcon like blows up a bunch of symbiotes uh, and, you know, and then you have Bucky helping out and he's taking down some symbiotes and then Cap side by side with him. Um, and then there's a point, I think, where Cap drops his shield and they pick it up and they hand it back to him. So there were some cool moments in there. And overall, this was fun, just a, it's fun action where everyone's just, you know, fighting against 
smaller forces of null, but that's all it is. I mean, it's a story that literally didn't have to be told. I mean, Cap running around with Null's voice still in his head. I mean, I don't know. There's no, that's, I guess, the biggest moment in this book is that Cap just gets over that psychological issue with the voice, but that's it. There's no, like, big payoff. There's no, like, so they don't take down a Celestial. Because, like, that's what I was thinking. I was like, you know, he, uh, Null kind of set up all these things, like, He's got possessed uh, celestials, which one of them I think was taken down recently. Um, but he has all these like uh, knights that are around and not just the dragons, but these other things. And I'm like, wouldn't it be cool if he had a couple more when he came to Earth? So that way they had targets like, OK, you guys go after Null. We'll go after this target and we'll go after this target. But everyone's target is just one of these stupid dragons and symbiote possessed people. And it's like. Yeah, it's, yeah, I don't know. I find that kind of boring because then the characters don't unite for one big moment at the end. Uh, but the, what they did that with um, Black Knight issue did that where they united against um, no replicating the Swordmaster demon thing. That was freaking awesome. So that's like, that's what I mean, like moments like that. Um, but this, you know, this issue didn't really have that. But it was still, I mean, it was okay. It was a fine issue. Like I said, all the artists do fine on their own, but together it definitely changes a little bit tonally. But the colorist did a good job kind of trying to keep all the palettes at least similar, which was good. So that helped kind of unify the artwork. So I, I liked it for that reason, but it, it still felt like a story that really didn't need to be told. And for $5, you can't really afford to put a book out there that doesn't really need to exist, uh, you know, in my opinion. Um, so I would say out of most of the tie-ins that I've read, that's probably one of my least favorite ones because I'm just like, eh, I like Cap a lot. and I, But it just felt like, let's get Bucky and Falcon into a story and then let's come up with this thing where Cap still hears the voice of Null in his head. But are the other heroes still doing that? Like, are we going to get a book where Storm still hears the voice in her head or Doctor Strange does? Yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a consistency. Sometimes I look for that. Um, but now the, the finale here. The final th things we're going to talk about in this episode are Thunderbolts issues 1, 2, and 3. Um, these are written by Matthew Rosenberg and Juan Ferreira is the artist on these. And uh, these are good. These are really good, actually. Um, it's pretty true to the Thunderbolts theme, which is bad guys. You know, it's it's bad guys pretending to be heroes. That's kind of what the Thunderbolts always has been, uh, for the most part, minus the time where, like, I guess Hawkeye was kind of taking over the team and, and trying to just be heroic. Um, but it was people with, like, a, sketch, a sketchy past trying to be heroic. The first Thunderbolts were literally bad guys dressed up as superheroes, and fooling everyone thinking they were superheroes. I always loved the first Thunderbolts run. Um, and I really loved the, um, I, well, I didn't love it, love it, but I liked a lot of the Warren Ellis stuff where the Thunderbolts were led by Norman Osborn. And even some of the stuff after that, where Norman was still an influence on the team, but they had Ghost and some other members on there. I kind of like those runs as well. This is really neat because it's Kingpin now has bought the, the copyright license of the name Thunderbolts. So now... Wilson Fisk owns the term Thunderbolts and has is opening the book with a public statement to the press saying that the Thunderbolts are back and they had just died saving New York. Um, and now that the threat of Null is is uh, imminent, like or the, 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 the I guess the defeat of Null is imminent. He's giving a press conference saying, um, you know, like that Null will be taken down soon, most likely. So this kind of takes place around, I guess, issue five. This is where the final battle's happening. So, but it doesn't spoil anything. So I like that. But he's like, yeah, it looks like Null's, you know, defeat is imminent. So I made a team of Thunderbolts to go out there and, and do one final push to fight back. And what they basically do is they're looking for a power source and using it, they want to explode it over near Null's lair to help expose Null, I guess, so that maybe the heroes can get in and stop him. I guess that's the plan. I mean, they're a little... A little vague on some of it, but I think that's ultimately the plan. And so uh, so it starts with him, with Kingpin giving a speech saying that the team died. And then it goes back in time, like a couple, like a day or so, where he went into the bar. Because remember, I think that was one of my criticisms of King and Black number one, was why does Kingpin just show up in a bar of villains and recruit everybody for something? Now I see why. He's trying to win more points from the press and being a politician and all that. And he recruits all these bad guys and he tells them, take off your masks uh, and you guys are all going to go and save New York City. And they're like, without our masks on? He's like, yes. And he goes, well, one guy's like, well, I object and I don't want to have anything to do with it. And Kingpin's like, that's cool. You know what? There's the door. Go on, you know, have a good life. 
And he's like, okay, cool. And the guy gets up, leaves the room, and then you hear, blam, uh, gun goes off. And Kingpin goes, oh, man. He's like, he must have, he tried to escape. And, you know, and he goes, uh, so I guess he paid the price. And one of my guards found him and shot him. And he goes, anybody else want to leave the room? <laughs> and everyone's like, okay, fine, we'll do this. Uh, and we'll take off our masks, I guess. Except Rhino, he's on the team, but he doesn't wear a mask. Uh, but uh, but as they're like walking through New York, it's all covered in symbiote. This is really cool. This feels, again, like a tie-in because they have a mission. It's not just to fight dragons. They have a goal, and it's uh, and they're walking through. It's very horror movie-esque. They're walking through this wasteland that was New York that has been taken over by symbiotes. Um, so it's it's really awesome. The visuals in this are great. Juan's artwork is amazing. And as they're walking, out of nowhere, one of the members gets bitten in half by a dragon and killed. So it's very much like a Suicide Squad book because that's what's happening. They're all essentially a Suicide Squad. So one member's dead, and then Mr. Fear is there, and he's like, oh, we got to turn around, we got to go back. And Taskmaster's like, no. By the way, we see Taskmaster's face. Not what I expected, but there's a reason for that, as we will see later on. Um, and then uh, and then we have this new girl named Star that's on the team, and she's apparently their big gun. So they're going to use her, so they need to keep her alive long enough to do what's going to be needed to be done at the end, which could possibly kill her too, because she's going to set off a massive power source that'll blow up. And if she doesn't get away in time, she could die. So basically they all know that they might die, and that they're on a suicide mission. And while... Uh, one of the like one of the members got eaten in half by the dragon. Another member is like, we gotta leave, we gotta leave now. And uh, uh, Mr. Fear walks up behind that guy and kills him. And it was a guy who had like electric gloves, not Shocker, but like a different guy with electric gloves. And he's like, look, we don't need this guy on the team. He's like, he was gonna leave anyway. We just need his gloves. So he gives one glove to Taskmaster and Mr. Fear, uh, or he gives them both to Taskmaster. And, and he's like, uh, Taskmaster goes, Mr. Fear, don't you want to keep these? He goes, nah, he goes, I like my weapon. I just killed that guy with it. So I think it's doing pretty good. So Taskmaster's like, okay. And he takes the, the gauntlets, puts them on. He's able to charge up electricity, charge his sword, and actually shoot a, a beam out too. So he's like, okay, this will work. I can, I can work with this. But then as they're reforming, now they've lost two members, one that they, Mr. Fear killed and one that the dragon killed. They kill the dragon. Star uses her powers, blows the dragon's head off. And then she starts to pass out. So apparently when she uses her powers, it weakens her. So she really is on a suicide mission because once she goes and activates his power source, she might not have enough power to get away um, because she'll be weakened and she might die. So uh, so they're definitely on a suicide mission now. It's very clear. So Rhino sees this and Rhino says, hey, he taps Taskmaster on the head. He goes, I'm leaving. And, uh, and he goes, and Taskmaster goes, okay. <laughs> And then Rhino just walks off and he quits the team. Like he's like, he he just watched three members die like in, in the span of like an hour. So he's like, I'm not sticking around. <laughs> so they're like, okay. And they're like, wait, aren't you going to stop him? And he goes, you know what? That guy's not easy to fight. So no, I'm not going to stop him. If he wants to walk off and get away from this deal, fine. He's like, but we're going to continue on this mission because Wilson Fist is going to pay us a lot of money and I plan on surviving this. So as they're leaving, the symbiote dragon that they killed the body comes to life like it has in other books and it possesses the, the body of the electric guy that they killed. So now he comes back as a symbiote and they have to run from him and fight him later on in the issue and Taskmaster cuts his head off and kills him again. And then they realize, holy crap, that's our teammate. He came back as a symbiote and we just killed him a second time. Um, so I thought that was that was a pretty fun moment. But then also Batroc, uh, the Leaper, is on the team and he, takes, he asks uh, Taskmaster for the gauntlets and he takes them and puts them on his legs and he starts leaping around and kicking symbiotes and fighting them off. Um, and he actually rejoins with the team and they're like, wait, did, were you touched by any of them? Because he stayed by or behind seemingly to die, you know, for the sacrifice play so the others can get away. But he didn't die and he shows back up and they're like, whoa, wait a minute, you're alive? And he's like, yeah. And they're like, they didn't touch you? And he goes, no one touches Betrock. And I'm like, okay, this is pretty cool. Like, I like the, the mission here. But I'm like, but what are they doing? They don't actually say what mission they're on what the power source is they don't they don't say anything so they reveal at the end of the first issue their first stop in finding this power source is going to ravencroft where they find norman osborne so what i like about this in issue two they go over it uh norman osborne is good norman osborne like he is in the spider-man comics he's he's been healed i guess uh so he's just playing along and he lets taskmaster in on that a little bit and uh and then also helps taskmaster come up with another plan that might kind of betray Kingpin. Uh, so uh, so while they're in Ravencroft, they're like, hey, should we free some of these enemies? They might help us, you know, 
fight back. We've lost three or four teammates now. Maybe we can recruit some people. So they're like, okay, not a bad idea. So they actually let a few people out of Ravencroft to be part of their group. And uh, one thing I love, though, before they do that is Mr. Fear walks into a room and he starts talking a little bit of crap about Kingpin. And, uh, and Kingpin is on the screen uh, and he hears it all. <laughs> and then he goes, uh, what did you just say? And he's like, uh, Mr. Fear goes, oh, no, I wasn't talking about you, Kingpin. And then Kingpin pulls one of these moves. I see you. I see you. I see you. Which one of you fuck faces is Damien Cockburn? Ah, uh, that's me, sir. Uh, it's good to finally meet you at last. Get some face time. And who here is a key grip? You. You. Hit that director in the face really fucking hard. Sorry, man. Oh! Ow! 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 Hmm. Oh. <laughs> pretty awesome man i i thought that was awesome it reminded me a lot of tropic thunder when he's like you know he's like who's the key p uh, key grip here he's like punch that director in the face that's what he does he goes taskmaster he's like yeah he goes punch him in the face <laughs> like, i thought that was so cool um so yeah it was really great it was a really funny moment and uh and so norman talks to taskmaster privately the others go out they recruit some members um but then a dragon busts in through the roof and i'm like oh god this thing again like that's all it is but no this time it wasn't a dragon that was alive some hero killed it and it crash landed on Ravencroft and it pours through and the symbiote, uh, you know, dragon comes apart and bonds with some of the inmates and then they break out. And now we have, you know, uh, the, the Thunderbolts here have with the few people they recruited having to fight other inmates who are now possessed. Uh, and I thought that was cool. And they all put their masks back on and become their supervillain selves again to fight back in this cool big two page spread, which is beautiful and awesome. Um, so then they, they do, they fight their way out, they get out of Ravencroft, they get on a bus, and they start to discover, okay, well, Norman Osborn told me where this power source is, so we're going to go get it. So they get on the bus, they're driving, and the, the, they run out of road, and that's when Star shows up, lifts up the bus, and carries them across. I think Star was on the bus, and then, like, Taskmaster kicked her off the bus, being kind of a, a D-bag about it. But then she came to their aid anyway, because she seems to be... A little bit more pure of heart than the others are she actually wants to help people um and uh, whereas the other teammates are just all criminals so uh so i kind of like her character she kind of reminds me of power girl a little bit with her design costume design um but she's has a, she's a little sketchy a little on edge sometimes but she does want to help people and she's the one who wanted to free some of the inmates who weren't possessed so they're all riding in the bus together so they they save a few people which is because of her but at the end they find the power source and it's actually the century. Well, not all of the century. Well, yes, all of the century, but not all together at once. Uh, they find his legs because obviously he's been ripped in half by Null in the first issue of King and Black when they try to use him as their big gun to fight Null and it didn't work. So they find his legs and then they go, okay, this is the mission. Now we got to find the top half of his body. It's got to be around here somewhere. So in issue three here um, by, again, Matthew Rosenberg and Juan Ferreira, uh, we have a star going into the ocean and retrieving the body of <laughs> of Sentry and then bringing him over to the team where Mr. Fear is like playing with his mouth and stuff. It's so creepy. He's playing with the, the top half of a dead body. And what they do is they duct tape his two halves together uh, and then they bring him on the bus with them. And he's just dead. It's just Bob slash Sentry just sitting there dead, his eyes looking up. And it's so creepy and weird. And they're driving the bus back into New York um, uh, you know, to, uh, to bring it to where Noel's base is. And they're like, see that big orb up there near that building? That's where Noel is. So we're going to go detonate the sentry. He still has the power of like 10,000 suns in his physical body. And even though his soul isn't here, if he explodes, explodes, like we can still, they still sense, you know, energy off him. So they're like, we can go and do this and, and wipe out, uh, you know, or at least, cause a big explosion that might hurt Null or, or, or expose him or whatever. So they're going on this mission, and as they're getting closer and closer, Null's forces sense this, and they're coming after them. So Taskmaster says, look, you guys go. I'll stay here and make the sacrifice. And they're like, really? Like, Taskmaster's going to? He's like, yeah, you guys changed my heart. Like, go. So as they go, he lied. And he's like, all right, I'm going to go hide behind here. And then all the enemies just ran right past where he was and started chasing where 
they were on pursuit, you know, in pursuit to the to the other teammates. So he pretty much just betrayed them, kind of. But you find out that that was all kind of part of the plan. So he sneaks away. He takes off his Taskmaster mask, exposing his human face again. But then he peels that off, and you find out that that wasn't actually his real face. So I was like, that's cool because I don't think I've ever seen Taskmaster's face, and I think that's always been a mystery about the character. So I like that they still preserve that because I'm like, wow, did they just reveal Taskmaster's face and that's what he looked like? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, but no, nope, it uh, turns out that was fake. So uh, so meanwhile, we have the, the actual bomb being lifted up and we have Typhoid Mary who last we saw her. So there's some continuity thing here. Last we saw her, she was with Wilson Fisk and she got possessed by a symbiote and she fought Elektra who was the new Daredevil. But here she is human and she's with Wilson Fisk. And apparently this is near the end of the battle of the Null stuff. So how, so I don't know. So maybe she got freed at some point. Uh, do we see that in the book? I don't know. But yeah, so it's him and Typhoid Mary and they're looking out and they see the, the giant bomb go off. So it looks like uh, Star carried Sentry up there and blew up. But in the end, we find out that it was a bunch of just double crossing going on. Wilson Fisk, we're back at the beginning of the book. He's given his uh, speech to, you know, the citizens of New York trying to say that, uh, you know, there's no actual citizens there. Most of them are bunkered down in their homes while the city is being taken over. But he's in a bunker somewhere broadcasting this saying, hey, the Thunderbolts have died. You know, the, they were heroes, you know, and, and he goes up and it allowed an opening so that the heroes, the other heroes of New York can now go. And so he's trying to take some credit for doing some good. But then the Thunderbolts show up and they're like, yeah, we're not dead. And we recruited a few new members um, and, uh, and they even have the sentry still there with them. So they never detonated him. I don't know if he actually can be detonated because he is dead. And so I think maybe they realize that. And so they decided to use, um, Figment or one of the members, uh, that they had that they recruited from, uh, Ravencroft. Apparently she can create, uh, illusions. And so she created an illusion that looked like the, the bomb went off and that it hurt, you know, Noel and stuff, but they didn't actually do it. So they kind of double crossed Wilson Fisk and they, uh, blackmailed him and they said look we're like he said fine what do you want like you're all gonna kill me I'll how about this I'll just pay you all anyway uh even though you didn't do the job I said and you didn't like help out uh you know hopefully the heroes will still pull together and save this stupid city anyway so what do you want and they said well pay us and he goes okay fine so he wires the money to their accounts he's like there you've all been paid now what and he goes they're like oh well that's just our first week's payment we want to check like that and deposit it into our accounts every week because we're going to continue to do this for you. Um, and, uh, and, and we're going to, we like playing heroes. So, uh, so think now that you've painted us in a positive light on the news, we want to keep doing this. Um, so I kind of, I like that a lot. I thought that was a fun ending. Um, so this book was awesome. Matthew Rosenberg, really good. I, I liked his stuff. Uh, I've liked some of his stuff before and he's not always, uh, he knocks it out of the park for me, but I there's some stuff I read I really liked like he did an annual for X-Men before they did all this the Jonathan Hickman stuff that I don't like um he did an, an annual where uh, Wolverine and Cyclops it was focusing on them two and them kind of like putting the past behind them and working together to rebuild the X-Men that was a damn good issue it was really really good and I I've, I've always ever since I've read that my friend Gene recommended that to me ever since I read that I've always kept an eye out for his stuff and like I said, sometimes he does good stuff. Sometimes I'm not on, on board. I liked some of his Punisher stuff because he, he had Punisher kidnap Danny Ketch and use him as Ghost Rider. And he teamed up with uh, Moon Knight and other characters. So I liked his run on Punisher as well. So, uh, I you know, I'm liking his stuff. So these issues I thought were a lot of fun. And, uh, and, and um, you know, I would recommend them big time. Like actually, the Guardian stuff, I would say read the run. Like I, I don't know what's going on in Guardians, but reading that issue made me want to know more. So I'm very grateful for Cam for donating these because I don't know if I would have, I probably would have waited a while to get into Guardians of the Galaxy, but now I want to get into it as soon as I have the money. Like I really want to, you know, pick up the trades and stuff. So, uh, so I'm, I'm curious to see where they take Guardians. The Black, the, the, the Black Panther issue that we talked about before, that was good, but the Cap one shot that was in this one, I did not like that much. Uh, you know, it's okay, um, but it, it really just serves zero purpose. I mean, okay, cool, you have Cap you know, kind of getting away from the last remnants of control that Noel or influence that Noel might have on him. But it's not a story that needed to be told, in my opinion. Um, it really wasn't. Uh, to me, it just felt like a way to get a Falcon and Winter Soldier story out there with Cap, which is fine. I mean, but make if that's your if, if that's like a company thing, like, 
hey, we want to do a, a one shot with Cap, Bucky, and and uh, Falcon, just in time for the show. It's like, and, and we want to tie it into the symbiote stuff. It's like, cool. If that's your impetus for doing the story, that's fine. It's a business decision, but that doesn't mean you can't do something creative with it. And I didn't feel like this issue was that creative. But the Thunderbolt stuff was a blast. And I highly recommend that. And I hope you guys are picking it up. And if you have read any of these yourself, please let me know what you think of them in the comments below. And as always, we'll continue our conversation down there. Okay, now it's about 12.35-ish, uh, somewhere around there, and it's Thursday morning. I got to go to bed soon, so I'll try to edit these whenever I have time and get them posted whenever I have time. Uh, but it's going to be a busy week for me because bike week is still going on. So I have you know tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. So uh, And I work long days, so I don't know if, if I'll have time to edit these, but whenever I can, all the episodes I recorded tonight, I'll get to you guys as soon as possible. Um, so thank you very much. And if I can't, I'll try to do some live streams over the next few days. Um, if I don't have time to edit these, that way we still get some content up, I'll do my best. Uh, but it's a busy week for me. But don't worry, after we get through bike weekend here um, and into next week, I'll be back to normal and I'll have my normal days off again and we'll get back to videos for sure. So thank you very much for watching the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And I'll see you in the future. Peace.